Good evening. It is six o'clock. It is time to begin our services here at Bobby Branch. It is so good to see everyone that's come out to be with us this evening. If you're here in the building, we're glad for your presence. If you're watching us online, thank you for taking the time to worship here with us at Bobby Branch. We hope you find the things that we do here at Bobby Branch in keeping with the New Testament teaching that God would have us to worship him with. Uh, we do have uh, Bible uh, worship at uh, 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. We have uh, Bible study following that. Of course, Sunday night at 6, and then Wednesday night at 7, we have Bible study also if you'd like to come and worship with us anytime. If you want to take out a Bible, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 9. Genesis 4, verse 9. That will be our reading that has been chosen for this evening. A few general announcements that we have. Uh, visitation group 4. Don't forget your meeting tonight in room 1 following services. Ne uh, December the 8th is the ladies' holiday party. Uh, sign up by next Sunday so they can let Kimmy's Tea Room know that's where it's going to be at. There's also going to be a gift exchange. There is a sign-up sheet out on the front uh, board out in the foyer. And uh, I was told that they are going to take the bus. So if you want to ride the bus or you need a ride, um, I see uh, Sister Stephanie. And uh, if you need a ride, and the bus will be leaving here at 530. So if you'd like to ride it out there, that will be good. December the 11th, which would be that Sunday, it'll be two weeks from today. We will have our fe uh, holiday fellowship meal following evening services. There will be a sign-up sheet on the board, uh, hopefully by Wednesday, if not by next Sunday. It is not going to be by letters like it's been in the past, so it's just going to be a sign-up. It's going to be soup, sandwiches, desserts, things like that, so it'll just be everybody sign up. Youth News, don't forget Home Devo tonight will be at Micah and Amy's house. Uh, the bus will be leaving following services if you need to, to ride that. Holiday gift giving starts December 9th, and there's several days with that. Check the iPad. CYC, don't forget to sign up for it by next week so he can get tickets. Bible Bowl is also next week. Our sick that we have at home, uh, we have... Oh, the death and the riches of God's saving grace.
number 717. <clears throat> I heard an old Thank you for the church here at Bobby Branch, and thank you for allowing us to meet tonight to worship you. Father, we pray for our local leadership here in town that they will follow your word in leading this local community. Father, we pray for our state leaders that they will lead this state in a scriptural basis. Father, we pray for our national leaders that they also will Look to your word for guidance. Father, we pray for the church here that you will strengthen us. We're thankful for the eldership here that in your wisdom you provided that they will lead this congregation in a righteous manner. Father, we're thankful for Brother Tony 
in the hard work that he puts in to impart the scriptures to us and help us apply this to our lives. Father, we pray that you will find this worship acceptable and we pray that we will sing with the Spirit to praise you and that you are worthy of all worship. Thank you for your Son and thank you for your grace. Forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Using the songbook number 421 will be our invitation song. And now before the scripture reading and lesson, we'll sing number 500. Oh, the crowns of every blessing. reading is taken from Genesis chapter 4 verse 9 then the Lord said to Cain where is your brother he said I do not know am I my brother's keeper during the year I try to plan the lessons that I'm going to preach and in doing so, I usually try to find some lessons that I think can cover a part of some of what is needed within the congregation, as well as trying to cover all of God's Word as we try to understand what God wants us to be and how God wants us to live. And so we're going to begin a series of lessons this evening. I don't know exactly how many lessons. I have thought about several, but I may modify that. I began to prepare for 2023, so if any of you have any series of lessons you would like for me to preach on, I encourage you to let me know. But we're going to begin a series of lessons talking about our brother's keepers. And what we want to do is to address the attitudes and the actions that are existing between brethren physically in the Bible and see if we can't draw some lessons from that about how we ought to live as members of the Lord's Church. We all know of dysfunctional families, and in fact, you may live in one of those, where there is a lack of love, a brotherly love for those within your family. 
Now, I would dare say that most of us during our lifetimes have had some spats with our siblings. But most of us have a kind of love between our families where we care about one another. We want to make sure that they're doing well. But some churches have also developed an unbrotherly kind of conduct to exist among them and among us, and we don't treat one another like we ought to treat one another. If you go to the Bible in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 17, Peter puts it very simply by saying, love the brotherhood. That's a very powerful statement in and of itself. When you think about all the people who are in the Lord's church, about our being brothers and sisters, he says, love the brotherhood. Paul wrote the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 9. He says, but concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Wouldn't it be great if every congregation of God's people loved one another like they ought to and had that same kind of appreciation for one another as they ought to? Well, you can imagine the first lesson will be about Cain and Abel. And the majority of the lesson is going to come from Genesis chapter 4. So if you will, please go ahead and take your Bibles because I may refer back to some of these verses from time to time. We're going to look at three things. We're going to look at a comparison and contrast between Cain and Abel. Two very simple ideas. Who was Cain and how did he think and what did he do? Who was Abel and how did he react to all of this? Then we want to express some concerns because as you study through this, you start saying, okay, now how does this apply? And what do I learn and what kind of concerns might I have developed because of this account? Number three, consequences. There's always consequences to the way we act. Good ones and bad ones. So let's begin, first of all. We're going to begin with Genesis chapter 4. We're going to read through verse 9. And I want you to listen carefully as we read the account of these two brothers, the first brothers. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at your door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass as they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Now, as we explore this, I think there's some things to observe. First of all, the common parentage. Cain and Abel had the same mother and father. You know, in today's society, you'll notice quite frequently, you'll have a mother and a father, but One may be the biological parent, the other may be a step-parent. Not the case here. Not the case as in some of the others where you had children by other wives or concubines. This is a case where you have Adam and Eve, and they have two sons raised in the same home by the same parents, and yet two chose two totally different ways. I know one of the things that I 
often will speak to parents and you have one child who's striving to do the very best in life they can do and another one that just seems to cannot stay out of trouble. People say, well, we raised them the same way, same home. Well, that's because people have the ability to choose. Second thing that you notice is they had some complementary occupations. And what I mean complementary is one did one thing and another did another, and both of them were very honorable professions. Abel was a shepherd. He tended sheep, raised sheep. That's invaluable occupation. Cain was a farmer. He was a tiller of the ground. That's also a very honorable profession. We shouldn't look at Abel and say, well, he had a better occupation or a better job than Cain did. Cain did a very valuable service as well as did Abel. And so they had complementary occupations. Third thing you'll notice is they both made a contribution to the Lord. They brought something as an offering. Now, uh, we can talk a little bit about that from Hebrews chapter 11. But I want you to notice here from what each produced, they brought of what they produced. But they did not bring the same thing, but nor did they bring it with the same attitudes. Now, if you were reading this carefully, you'll say the Lord respected Abel and his offering. The Lord did not respect Cain or, or and his offering. See, there's the attitude and there is the offering. You know, John chapter 4 tells us that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so there is the fact that you have not only to do the right thing, but you have to do it with the right attitude. Hebrews 11 and verse 4 says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts that through it, he being dead still speaks. And then 1 John three twelve says, Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. You'll see that there was a distinction here between the brothers because one of them was a good man, one of them was a bad man, and what the type of person he was was what he offered. Now the text goes on to tell us that Cain's countenance fell. Your countenance is the way you look. And you can see it on someone's face quite frequently when they become mad at you. And Cain became angry and his countenance fell. You could see it on his face. He was flourishing with this wrath in his heart. And God looks at him and he says, Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? But if you do not, he said, sin lies at your door. You know, occasionally you may open your door and someone be standing there. Or maybe even you open your door and an animal is there. And it surprises you and shocks you because it's there ready to pounce. Sin lies at your door. And he goes on to say, its desire is for you. It wants you. The question is, Cain, are you going to let it in? It's desires for you. He said, but you should rule over it. You should rule over it, Cain. And Cain refused to do so. And what that led to was a conflict with Abel. If you'll notice verse 8, it says that he talked with Abel. He talked with him. I've often wondered what that conversation might have been. Would it have been, you think you're that much better than I am? Would have Cain looked at Abel and said, why did you get the good sacrifice and I got the bad one? There's all sorts of things that could have been a part of that conversation between these two brothers. But the text says he rose up in the field and killed him. That anger got the very best of Cain and he murdered his brother. 
Now, when you continue reading, it says in verse 9 that God looked at Cain and he asked him, where is Abel your brother? God knew where Abel was. In fact, the blood of Abel was crying out from the ground. Where's your brother Abel? He lied to the Lord. He said, I don't know. He knew where he was. He knew what had happened to him. But then he asked that proverbial question, that is, am I my brother's keeper? And that's going to be the question that's going to permeate all of our lessons that we're going to go through is, am I my brother's keeper? Am I responsible for the way that I treat you? Does God look at me and say, are you going to do what is right? Or are you going to do what is wrong? And that's the question that we have to answer here. Now, obviously, what's going to follow from that is Cain is going to be cursed. You go on down through verse 11, and he will tell him that the ground is no longer going to yield its strength for you. The crops are going to be unproductive. You know, I've seen times where I've gone out and I've planted tomato plants with great enthusiasm, thinking they're going to come up, and they come up with just little old shriveled up plants. Maybe the stems on them turn dark and soon the plant dies. And I wonder why my thumbs are not green. Well, I want you to imagine, here's Cain, who is a tiller of the ground. He knows how to grow things. The ground's not going to produce for him. That's going to be a struggle in and of itself. He's also going to be a vagabond. He's going to travel from place to place in searching for something that will sustain him, and he's not ever going to be able to find it. Put yourself in a position of trying to, in the rest of your life, trying to find some place where you can be happy, some place where you can succeed, some place where things are going to go in the right direction, and Cain is never going to find it. He's going to respond, my, my punishment is greater than I can bear. You know, folks, you need to think about this before you do something wrong. You need to plan on the consequences of that. Now, what that's going to do is lead me to some concerns, some things to think about in all of this. Now, here are some things that I think as we start applying is sometimes a person can do everything right and be hated for it. Some of you in your family maybe are trying to be the right person, do the right thing, to go in the right direction. And it seems as if at every turn, as you're trying to do the right thing, other people are looking at you and saying, I don't like that. In Matthew 5 and verse 10, Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Being persecuted for righteousness' sake. That's exactly what Abel was done. He was persecuted for his righteousness' sake. Or 1 Peter 3, verse 14, he said, But even if you suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Don't. Let someone else make you feel that you're a failure because you're trying to do what's right. 2 Timothy 3, 12, Paul puts it to Timothy so basic, so uh, just in a short capsule. He said, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Sooner or later, if you're trying to do what's right, there are going to be people like Cain who are going to say, I don't like you. And sometimes that hurts. Sometimes in our community, we're trying to stand up for moral principles. We're trying to stand up for the right thing. What do you face? Sometimes you face criticism when you don't deserve it and you're trying to do what's right. Second thing that I think could be observed as a concern here is sibling rivalry. It's real. And sometimes it's very prevalent in some families. I got to be honest with you. When I was preparing for this and I tried to get to this point, I thought, I can't tell you how many times when somebody passes away, 
and the children are left, that's when you really see the sibling rivalry come out. You see people who have tried to do the right thing all along then become the bad guy. And you've seen some people who are constantly motivated by greed and I'm afraid you're going to get this and the other one is going to get that and it becomes all about money and possessions and things and the person who provided those have almost begun to be forgotten in all of this. Sibling rivalry is real and it can get out of hand. And in this case, it needs to be addressed and God addressed it. Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? When God looks at Cain, he says, don't be mad at Abel, your brother. You have the ability, you have the uh, privilege of doing the right thing yourself. And God also warns him of the consequences that could follow from that. The third thing that I think needs to be raised as a concern is participation in a religious service is no indication of the condition of the heart. What do I mean by that? A person can go through the motions, can do the right action, but they do it with the wrong attitude, with no fervor, or they can do the wrong thing. Now, in some cases, a person, what they offer to the Lord, they may offer with zeal, they may offer it with a good intent, but they don't do the right thing. In Romans chapter 11, or chapters 10 and 11, Paul said, in particular chapter 10, he said, I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. You can have zeal, but do the wrong thing. But in this case, you have a person who made an offering to God, but he didn't give it as God wanted him to. God did not respect Cain nor his offering. Listen to 2 Timothy 3 verse 5. He said, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. From such people turn away. Or Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9. These people draw near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Here's the problem. Sometimes people come, and they make an offering to God, but it's not with a good heart. Do you think it's possible that as we come here to worship God and we sing praises and we pray prayers, that we're looking at other people with jealousy, we're looking at other people with envy, we're looking and judging people rather than trying to encourage those who are our brethren? That's a real concern or ought to be a real concern. Perhaps one of the greatest concerns of this text is the anger that was involved. Because anger is a dangerous emotion that sometimes can lead to more sins. A person becomes angry and they say something they ought not say. A person becomes angry and they do something to someone else. They subvert them. On well, Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Here's what the devil would like for you to do. He'd like for you to be angry at everybody about everything. Because he knows if he's got you with anger, you're going to let things just continue to boil beneath the surface. And that's the reason why he says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. It's time to get over it. And he says, don't give place to the devil. Proverbs 29, verse 11, a fool vents all of his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. That's what Cain did. He let his feelings just vent. He talks to Abel, and then he kills Abel. James 1, verses 19 and 20 
So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Now, why? Verse 20, for the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. My anger does not serve God very well. And God had warned Cain. Cain, you got to be careful. Sin's lying at your door. Its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. We've got to be careful with our anger in our hearts. Leads me to the third part of our lesson, the consequences. We sometimes don't understand that our relationship with our brethren affects our relationship with God. We struggle with this idea to say, well, it's just between me and God. It doesn't have anything else to do with you folks. No, that's not right. This is 1 John 4, verse 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Well, John makes it so difficult for us to come along and say, I can hate you and I can mistreat you, and yet I can still be in a right relationship with God. You can't do that. God won't accept that. If I live in strife and I live in conflict and I live in envy and I live in jealousy, it's not going to get me to heaven. Having the right attitude not only means we do them no harm, but we actually do something to help them. Now listen to that very carefully. You don't just not do harm, but you do good. You think about how Jesus treated people who mistreated him. You know what I can give you is one of the greatest examples the very people that nailed Jesus to the cross, the very people that put him there, who were his brethren according to the flesh, he said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. The Lord didn't hate those brethren. In fact, he died for them. In 1 John 3, 17 and 18, he says, but whoever has this world's goods sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him. How does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You see your brother in need. What do you do? Do you say, as James will say in James chapter 2, be warmed and filled, but you don't give them what's needed for the body? He says, what's that going to profit? Second of all, I think we have to be really concerned about the spiritual needs. We ought to be concerned about the physical needs. We really have to be concerned about these spiritual needs as well. When I go to the book of 1 John and well as the book of James, I can see this genuine concern for a person's spiritual life. 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death. He will ask, and he will give him life for those who commit sin and not leading to death. You see your brother sinning a sin? You know what you ought to do for him? You ought to pray for him. You go to verse 20, and he says, confess your faults to one another. James 5, verse 16, verse 20. Confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And then verse 20, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Rather than looking at people as the Pharisee did in Luke 18, and looking down on them, we ought to look across at them and say, what can I do to help? And if I don't know what to do to help, then I need to ask God and pray for one another because that's what will get us to heaven. And that's being a brother's keeper, as God would teach. Now, let me give you a summary. Uh, you know, when you get through preparing a lesson and you say, I feel like I didn't cover everything I need to cover. Well, let's, let me just give you a summary statement here. What we give makes a difference. 
What Cain gave and what Abel gave made a difference. By faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Number two, don't envy others. Don't look at someone else and because they're doing better than you're doing to make that to be envious of them. Strive to do what you could do. He said, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Number three, there's a right way to do things. Which the corollary of that is, is there's a wrong way to do things as well. Number four is there are consequences to our actions. There was consequences of the gifts being offered, and there were consequences to the death that took place of Abel. Cain had to answer for that. You have the power to do the right thing. It may be difficult. The way may be hard. People may make it difficult for you in life, but you can do the right thing. You can make the right choice. And God was wanting Cain to make that right choice. I'm going to end again going back to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4. And there the latter part of that verse says, God testifying of his gifts that through it, he being dead still speaks. Abel has been dead a long, long time. Going all the way back to just right after the creation. That blood that Abel shed still speaks today about being righteous and doing the right thing. And tonight, you can be righteous, but to be righteous with God involves our being obedient to his will. That means that we have to believe in Jesus, his son. We have to repent of our sins. We have to confess our faith in him and be baptized. And the Lord will add us to his church, to his body. It also means righteous living day to day, saying the right things, doing the right things. It also means repenting of the wrong things, making a correction daily in our lives. And if you're here and you're a brother or you're a sister and you're struggling and you want prayers, that's what we're here for. We're here to help. We're going to sing, Love Lifted Me, and if you need to respond, please come as we stand and sing. I was to sing and stand far from the peaceful shore.
Once again, we want to welcome each and every one. We're glad that you chose to be with us and worship with us here this evening for our Sunday night services at Bobby Branch Church of Christ. If you are here with us and you were unable to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, the communion has been left prepared, and if you will proceed to out the auditorium in the back and to the door to your left, room one, there will be men there that will help you with that and to complete your services this evening. I also want to remind visitation group four of your meeting this evening uh, following services, also in room one after services. So, uh, as we've ended a, a week of a holiday that we uh, look at Thanksgiving and being thankful for those things that we've had and the people that are in our lives, we also have this time of the year where we're spreading love and joy. And we certainly uh, want to do that, as I mentioned this morning. And, uh, uh, but we want to do that all the time, not just from Thanksgiving through Christmas. Uh, we, want, we want to be able to do that. And I think that's part of Tony's lesson this evening. But I do want to remind all of us, um, there are people in our congregation, there are people in our world, they're hurting. And uh, some have lost loved ones this year. Others have lost jobs. They were in other situations. A lot of different things for a lot of people being in a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. And so our kind words, our kind actions can help immensely for these people. Not only this time of the year, but especially this time of the year. This is a time of the year where there is a lot of depression, especially if you've lost someone uh, or if uh, you're in a financial uh, situation or something along those lines, it's very easy to to get into those situations. And so sometimes just a kind word or a kind action to them can really turn them in that, around. And who knows, maybe they look to you and they look to you as a Christian and they want to know more about God's word. Maybe they want to know more about how to be like a Christian and to be a Christian and to obey the gospel. So Let's, let's keep that in mind as we think about each other and care for each other. Again, not just for the next two or three weeks, but each and every day. We'll have one more song and a closing prayer. Sing to me, God, sing thy song.
please. Father, we're so thankful that we've had this day to come together with like-minded Christians to have a time of worship, a time of fellowship, to have a day where we can all stop and rest and focus our minds on you. And at this time of the year, Father, we're particularly mindful of the blessings that we have in our lives. We pray that each one of us will be able to carry that mindset with us through this week. We'll be able to focus on our blessings and more than we do on our challenges. And Father, we pray that as we go through this week, we'll keep you as the focus of our lives, that we'll turn to you for strength and for guidance until we are able to come together again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.